So I think we're ready to go. Okay, so today we are going over our systems for success. If you've never um, listened to any of my sessions before, I have a whole program called Systems for Success. It talks about all the different uh, real estate systems that all the agents need. Um, if you're one of our Percy Fulton agents, you can find everything pretty much in our Google Drive and you'll see all these documents. So this document that I'm going over today, you do have access to it. It'll be on the Google Drive. I'll email it to you guys at the end. But for today, we're just going to kind of go through it and talk about some of our tips on winning multiple offers for your buyer clients. Um, so in the chat, actually, if you guys could let me know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are getting killed out there in some multiple offers, or maybe you guys have been competing quite a bit. Um, I would love to know who's out there working with buyers right now, what, or even tenants. I heard there's a lot of bidding wars happening in, with tenants right now. So this may be coming in some good timing for all of those that are getting defeated. They've got some buyers that are getting a little upset because they're not winning um, the properties that they were hoping for. So that's what I want to kind of tune in today to see if I can give you guys some advice to help you guys come on top when you guys are negotiating and competing with other buyers. So let's get to it. Um, the objective of today is basically we're going to help you uh, provide you with preparation to navigate this competitive real estate market. Um, so we're going to talk about bidding wars, how to compete against strong sellers, and really ensure that your clients are well prepared for the offer negotiations. So not only does this approach really benefit your clients, but it's also going to help demonstrate your professionalism and build a strong foundation for your business relationship with the other agents out there in the industry. Um, this is really important, actually, while we're on the topic of building a relationship with the other brokers. Um, typically, when you go in a multiple offer situation, especially when you're going against listing agents that are prominent in the area, they're going to remember you. Um, for all of your other offer presentations. So it's really important that when you are doing offers, you come in strong, you come in professional, you come in knowing what you're doing. And that way, when if you ever come across that agent again in the future, hopefully they know how you work, they trust you and they trust your clientele. And it's really gonna help you in the future as well. So um, being professional during these multiple offers is really gonna be a benefit for you. <clears throat> So why is having the negotiation skills important in your business? So a lot of us went to school, we all went to Humber College, um, and you realize they don't really teach you, or even Aria, sorry, they don't teach you much about how to actually negotiate a sale. It's all really about the contracts, how not to go to Korea jail, all that good stuff. And so that's kind of where we come in, where we kind of teach you a little bit more about um competing and negotiating that's where we come in right so we're going to talk a little bit about that and I'm going to be talking to you guys really from a listing agent's perspective so our team here we do a lot on the listing side and so I want to give you guys some tips coming from a listing agent or seller's perspective because that's really going to help you guys when you're working with your buyer clients so again this is not something that you learn a lot it's not really even an easy topic to teach because it's really a situational thing. Um, it's really hard to be scripted during negotiations. It is a very um, experience-based skill that just comes with time, comes with experience. And really the only way to build your negotiation skills is to really put yourself out there and get into some multiple offer situations or just offer situations. So this is gonna come with time, but hopefully I can give you guys some knowledge and some tips just from being in the industry, working out on the streets there with both buyers and sellers and hopefully um, give you guys some skills to really achieve some of the best deals for your clients, build trust, credibility, stand out in the competitive market, um, hopefully teach you how to solve some conflicts, obstacles, and really enhance your client satisfaction. So by effectively advocating for your clients and navigating these negotiations, maximizing value, you can really deliver a really successful outcome and establish, again, a solid reputation in the industry, which is what we're all here for. Sorry, I'm just going to answer questions there. Perfect. So there is a technique to running with multiple offers. So I just want to let you guys know of different situations that you should be aware of, that you should let your clients know before you actually submit an offer. And that is to remind your buyer that in a multiple offer situation, uh, real estate can actually sell for more than asking. 
Um, sellers can actually refuse a full price offer or really any offer, which I'm sure a few of us have um, seen where you go into an offer night, there's a 10 offers, and then the seller decided to refuse all 10 of those offers. That is a situation that can happen. Um, as well as in a multiple mm -hmm. offer situation, properties can often sell for more than asking price. So these are different situations that can happen, but these are things that you need to remind your buyer clients of as well um, to really keep your negotiation skills and market knowledge up to date. So let's dive into a couple of these tips. So what are multiple offers? First of all, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but multiple offers are also known, I guess, as a bidding war. And these are going to occur in real estate when there's basically multiple buyers that are interested in a certain property and they all put in an offer at the same time to compete for that property. So typically um, it creates a very competitive environment. Each buyer is going to submit their highest and best offer with the intention of hopefully outbidding the other offers to secure that property. So typically when you end up in a multiple offer situation, this can result in an increased sales price. Um, again, as because um, buyers try to outbid um, th that property to secure it for themselves. So usually this is a situation that is an advantage for the sellers um, because they can receive all those offers and surpass that initial asking price. But on the other side, this can be really challenging for the buyers and the agents working with the buyers because they need to really carefully strategize and make a competitive offer to really increase their chances of success. So this is where you guys are going to come in. Um, real estate agents, you guys really play a crucial role in guiding your buyers and the sellers in the multiple offer situation. So it's up to us to navigate those negotiations and help your clients make informed decisions. Um, I'm going to teach you guys um, a little bit in this negotiations that at the end of the day, it's going to be your clients that are going to be the making those big decisions. Your main role is really just to educate them, strategize and help guide them into making those decisions that will help it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be your clients that are going to be making the big decision. They're going to be making the offer and it's going to be up to them what they want to do based off the knowledge that you're giving them. So prior to writing one of these offers, um, it's very important to discuss with your buyers the seller's options that they have when they receive multiple offers. So you really need to put your buyer clients into the seller's situation because it's very easy for the buyers to get really angry about going into multiple offers. So if we can kind of put them at ease and just let them know ahead of time what the scenarios are going to be, it kind of eases the pain a little bit. And then your buyers go in a little bit prepared being like, yep, you did tell me that this was going to happen and it doesn't turn into this ugly situation. So even for you as an agent, if you're going into multiple offers, don't let it freak you out. It seems a little bit more stressful than it needs to be. That's what we're here for um, as your management team. If you're going into multiple offers, please call us before you go into one. Or if you're representing the sellers, also call us before you go into it because we want to help guide you. So if you are going into your first situation alone, call us because we'll walk you through it a little bit and then use this guide as well um, before you go in a situation and hopefully it can kind of guide you as well. So here's the different situations that may happen on a multiple offer scenario. And again, you would sit down with your buyer client and go over these different situations for them as well. So situation one, um, the sellers will accept your buyer's offer. Congratulations. You submitted your offer and they were like, yep, you're the one I want. Um, don't want any of those other offers. You're accepted. Congrats. Seems very easy. It's never that easy, to be honest. Um, there is some agents out there that will not do multiple rounds. They'll do one round and then they'll pick a buyer. So it could happen, but um, usually it's a little bit more complicated than that. Another scenario would be the sellers would sign back your client's offer, which is otherwise known as a counter offer. So in this situation, it's very rare that a seller is going to sign back. So as a buyer's agent, don't ever be like, well, just sign back my offer, sign back my offer at what you want. That's It's just not that easy from a seller's perspective to do that because say they've got five offers on the table, they sign back yours, they are all of a sudden now they are stuck to your offer. And if one of these other offers improves on their own, they're stuck with yours. So it's very unlikely when you will ever see a seller sign back a buyer's offer in a multiple offer situation. The best is to just listen to what the sellers are asking of you, what changes they want from you. And then they'll ask you to probably make those changes and put it back in their court. Whether you've written the offer and you've done a bunch of changes before that, 
the seller's just helping you out because it's very rare where an, an agent's going to recommend the seller to sign back your offer. But in any case, if they do sign back, your client has the option to either accept that sign back and then ensuring that they bought the, they got the house, they, but they lose that opportunity to negotiate a better deal. So the seller may sign back at a higher price. You can accept it. Awesome. You, you have an accepted offer on the property, but again, you lose that opportunity to negotiate a lower price if you didn't want to go that high in the alternative, if your buyer gets a sign back and they decide, you know what, we want to sign that offer back. Um, this is something you could do, but your client is going to risk giving the seller another opportunity to reopen the bidding to the other buyers, because now all of the offers are now back on the table. They're not stuck to you. So that is a risk of signing back on a sign back from a seller. So let them know of that situation. The other situation that, again, I just spoke about a little bit earlier, the seller may actually reject all of the offers altogether. And we see this quite often. I'm starting to see it poke back a little bit more in the last week or so. But um, you may have 10 offers on the property and it wasn't near where the sellers wanted. Maybe the sellers got stressed out. Could be a divorce situation. You never really know what's happening on the other side. But the seller could just decide that they want to not accept anything. So then you just go back to your buyer let them know they chose not to work with any of the offers. And then you guys may decide that maybe the next day you want to resubmit the same offer, or maybe you want to send another offer and improve that one, or you guys just may move on to the next home altogether. So if you let the clients know that this is a situation that may happen, it helps ease the pain a little bit. And then they're not so angry about it because you prepared them for it. So it's very easy for the buyers to get against the sellers and have something against them. So we wanna avoid all conflict at all times. We wanna keep everyone at a happy medium throughout these situations. Another scenario that may happen is the seller may actually hold on to your offer, but sign back another offer. So they may like your offer. And actually, to be honest, this happened to us last night um, in an offer situation where we really wanted to have this offer, but we were getting an improved offer from another agent. So what we did was we kind of just held on to both of them and then we got the other offer. We didn't love that other offer. So what we did was we signed back at the other buyer's offer with a very quick irrevocable time. So they had no time to think. And then if they rejected our offer last night that we submitted, then we still had about 30 minutes Morning, to go and accept the other Good, yeah. offer if this one didn't work out. So there is situations where the seller may do that. And you sometimes don't even know this is happening behind the scenes as the buyer's agent, that the seller is actually signing back on other offers and working with them, but keeping you happy in the meantime, because they want to use your offer just in case these other ones don't work out. So your buyer is still going to be bound to their irrevocable time. And that's why some sellers can do this, but if they're signing back, they're going to change it and make it very quick. So this situation can happen behind the scenes as well. And another situation that may happen is the seller may hold on to your offer and then reject all of the other offers. So it may not mean that they're choosing your offer. They may ask you to submit a better offer, but letting you guys know that, hey, we rejected all of the other offers. It's just you now and we want to work with your offer, but there's some things that we need to change about it, whether it's the price, deposit, irrevocable. So that's a situation that you guys may get into as well. If you think of any other situations, put them in the comments below, but these are the most common things that I see happen on a multiple offers um, night. Okay, so we're gonna talk now about what's gonna happen before you guys are like, while you guys are in the preparation before an offer night. After that, I'm gonna talk about what's gonna happen on offer night, and then I'm gonna give you guys some tips on strengthening your offer and all of that. So let's just talk about some of the top producer tips before presenting your offer. So it's going to make for a much, much smoother transaction if your buyer clients are fully aware of what they need to do and what they're going to be faced with in the offer situation. So again, you may want to go back to the scenarios and have a quick sit down with them, let them know that these are some things that can happen. But here's some tips and tricks as well for you guys to get your clients prepared for it as well. So sometimes in a multiple offer situation, you may actually have to act very quick. Sometimes you don't have a lot of time to make quick decisions. Um, time is a very precious thing in a multiple offer situation and you may feel rushed. It may feel chaotic. So by preparing your clients and educating them about the process, it's going to help your client gain some trust in you. And then when offer night comes, 
they're going to be heavily relying on you a little bit more to um, help them get to that finish line there. So tip number one before going into an offer night is I would go over all of the paperwork ahead of time. So I would either go to their house, have a Zoom meeting, have some sort of meeting with your clients where you're going to pop out the agreement. I would grab the uh, agreement of purchase and sale, confirmation of cooperation, schedule A, schedule B, grab every form that they're going to be signing on offer night and go over everything with them. So that on offer night, they're not like, well, what does this clause mean? What does this mean? Because you've already talked about it and now you're able to act quickly. So you're going to want to do things like go over all of the blanks that they're going to be filling out, go over every single clause, the ones that are standard in there, as well as the uh, schedule A that we give to you guys when we draft your offers for you. So go over every single clause with them, make sure all of their questions are answered so that you guys can act quickly. Um, you're also probably going to talk about pricing strategy. So you may talk about, um, they're going to want to know what price do you want to give? And this is probably one of the most common questions you're going to get as a buyer's agent. Your clients are like, well, what should I offer? What should I offer? You should be very upfront with them and let them know. Um, I don't know what price to offer yet because I don't know what situation we're getting into. If there's 10 offers, that may have a certain price, but then if there's two offers, that may also change the price. So here's a range of maybe where the price should go, but we're not going to choose a price really until the day of multiple offer day when we really know what we're competing with and what we're working with. So you will talk about different pricing strategies, talk about what offer you may come in if there's this many offers, what price you'd come in if there was this many offers. Um, what offer you want to start with. Maybe you can talk about what your max is. So these are conversations that you're going to want to have with your client before the offer night. Um, also going over all of the conditions. So I would talk about what a finance condition looks like. What will the inspection look like? Um, what will a status certificate look like? So, and then talk about having a conditional offer versus a firm and why a seller would prefer to have a firm offer versus a conditional offer, but also explaining the risks to your own client on if they decide to get rid of the conditions, what that means. For Good them. morning, Bolton Steel. So you're going to talk about all of these situations so that they're comfortable because this who knows? And you may even get the mortgage department. brokers involved, you may get the lawyers involved, the you may have an inspector account, ready to go to all prepare for the strategy. So there's going to be a whole team of people you're going to have to bring transfer. in. And make sure that you're if in you constant contact with the mortgage broker yeah. and be like, hey, Basically, we might be competing against 10 to offers to today. Department. I just need some confidence that I can get rid of that condition. And the mortgage broker may say, no, I'm not comfortable with you getting rid of that condition. So these are conversations you need to have with the mortgage brokers as well to get their confidence in your client's ability or get what prices that they can do. Um, if you're going in with a status certificate, you may decide, hey, we're going to get the status certificate reviewed before the offer night if they have it. So that might be part of the strategy as well. Maybe you've got a home inspector like, hey, I'm going to be doing a home inspection. Can you get it done in two days instead of five? They want to keep the inspection, but instead of having five days, we're going to make it quick. Do you have availability? So getting those appointments all set up as well and strategizing on what you're going to do with the conditions is going to really help you as well. Um, don't underestimate the irrevocable time strategy as well. Um, I know a lot of people do the 1159 PM. That may be a good start, but then once you start to get into the nitty gritty of the offer night, and maybe you're improving your offer a little bit, your strategy may change. Be like, listen, we're going to increase our price. We're going to take away some conditions, but I'm only going to give you now 20 minutes to decide if you're going to accept it. So sometimes having the time pressure is also going to be part of your offer strategy. Um, we did this last night, for example, when we signed back at one of our, we had two offers that we were going between. They were both very similar. One of them I liked better than the other, but the other one offer was technically a little bit stronger. So what we did is you sign back and I'm like, hey, I'm signing back and giving you 20 minutes. If you bail out, I'm going to accept the other offer. So using time to your advantage is really going to come in handy when you guys are dealing with um, with your mark or sorry, your offer strategies as well. So keep the timing in mind as well. Uh, deposit is something very important you need to talk about. And I guarantee every agent has probably made this mistake for sure when they're in their first multiple offer situation. And that's the deposit. So of course, we're going to talk about um, deposit a little bit more, but telling them why a larger deposit is important and why the timing of the delivery is important as well. So having a larger deposit, for example, um, we recommend having 5%. This is important to talk to your clients about because 
if they have a large enough deposit, it shows that they are not going to walk away from it. If it should be a $50,000 deposit and your clients are like, no, I only want to offer $10,000 deposit, let them know, be like, okay, this is why I recommend that you can do whatever deposit you want, but this is why I recommend that you do 5% is because it's going to let the sellers know that you're serious. And then if anything goes wrong, you're not going to back out and you are in this deal. If you're in like a $2 million deal and you've got a $10,000 deposit, it's very easy to walk away from that. You're like, you know what? I actually don't want this house anymore. So I'm just going to back away and lose my $10,000 deposit. So that's exactly why it's important to that the deposit's strong. I've lost offers, honestly, with the same exact price on a home, but I was $10,000 less on a deposit. So there may be situations where you're in a multiple offer situation. The buyers are all at a very similar price. But at the end of the day, that deposit is larger on this buyer. So we're going to pick that buyer. So you could lose very easily just because of a deposit price as well. The timing of the deposit is also very important. Um, you do need this deposit within 24 hours. And this is the mistake I have definitely made where your clients put in the offer, they get it accepted, and then you send them the deposit instructions and they say, oh, I actually don't have this money available right now. It's in investments. It's in stocks. It's going to take me three to five business days to actually get that money out. Now, all of a sudden, you're not delivering the deposit and you guys can lose the transaction. Um, the amount of times I've seen this happen, and I feel like every agent makes this mistake at least once, and then they'll never make this mistake again. So when you're preparing for your offer, ask your clients straight up, where's the deposit coming from? Is it liquid? Like, is it a checkings account? Can you whip it out like tomorrow? Is it available or is it in stocks? Because you need to call the bank and get access to that now. And then you may need to get creative on your deposit in your offer. And you're going to say, okay, on acceptance, we're going to give you $10,000. And then in a couple of business days, we'll give you the rest. So you may actually have to add that into your offer as well. So it's very important to find out where that money is coming from and how much they have. Uh, and finally, closing date. This can also be important because, again, from the seller's perspective, they may have actually purchased a property. So you may actually see that a seller may put an actual closing date that is important to them. And that's likely because they either bought a place or they have a reason why they picked that date. So if you can get your clients to come to that seller's date, it will help your offer as well. Um, because sometimes it's not just about the price. It's about how much deposit it's going in and when can these people move in and does it line up with where the sellers need it as well. So again, these are all very important things. If you need help with the APS, um, you're not very good at um, describing it. There is a forms explained on Stratus um, where it has like the all of the agreements and then it's got um, forms explained in red. So red describing each clause and so if you're not very good at explaining it, you can read the red clauses with your clients, send this to them as well. And then it will help you go over those clauses. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, um, put it in the comments and I will, I'll send it to you. All right. So another one, again, be prepared. I can't tell you enough how important it is to be prepared for this presentation. Um, because honestly, your offer, it's all about the presentation of the offer. So when you're presenting the offer, you need to have a backup on your market stats. You need to know every single comparable in the area. Don't ask the other agent what their expectations are. I will tell you right now, it's probably one of the top three annoying questions that a listing agent gets from a buyer's agent. And it's probably the most common question we get as well. And as always like, well, what are your seller's expectations? Well, I know my seller's expectations, but like, I don't want to tell you that. And the reason I don't want to tell you that is because they want as many offers as possible. Whether, you your, offer is low or offer whether your offer is high, I want all of the offers. So the seller's, agent does, seller's agent does not want to give you their expectations because they don't want to freak your clients out and then prevent you from coming in on offer night. So your job as the buyer's agent is to know the market stats. You should know the comparables. You should know HPI. You should know assessed values. Um, other things to do is talk to the neighbors around the listing. If you see them outside, ask them why they like living there. They may actually know why the seller is moving. This is, again, another thing that the seller's agent is not going to disclose most of the time is why they're moving. Um, could be a divorce situation. It could be um, they're having a baby. They don't want to tell you their motivation because it could be used against them. So at the end of the day, it's very important for 
the seller's agent to protect certain facts from you as a buyer's agent, that's going to protect their seller. So if you ever call a listing agent and you do ask them what the expectation is, oh, so sorry. I didn't realize everyone was on, not on mute guys. One second. Who's not on mute? I'm going to mute all of you. <laughs> so sorry. Um, okay. So again, if you, yes, don't ask the agent what your, what their expectations are. That is up to you to figure out. You can maybe ask them if there's a certain comparable that they're looking at, but otherwise I would, um, I would kind of avoid that question or reword it in a different way. So don't say, what are your client's expectations? Say, Hey, is this a good comparable that you guys are looking at? Um, anything like that. Don't ask them what price they're looking at anything like that. It's just like a, it's a bad question to ask. <laughs> so we're going to move on from that. But when you are calling the other agent, think of different ways to talk to the agent, say, what closing date are you looking for? Um, is there a deposit that you're looking for? Stuff like that. Some, anything about the price, because they're not going to give you the price. And it's just a really awkward question for the listing agent to answer. Okay. So now we're going to talk about, um, the blind bidding. So of course, before the offer presentations, you want to warn your buyers that the standard practice in offer situations is for the listing brokerage and the seller to conduct a blind bidding process. So your buyers um, will never know what the other offers were. So make sure you tell your clients this because they are going to ask you. They're going to say, well, what were the other offers? So you need to ahead of time, just let them know. I don't know. We're never going to know the other offers. I don't know. Sometimes the listing agent may tell us where we're sitting and that's about it. So even if your buyer is the successful winner, you're never going to know how much more or less they offer than the next bidders. So you're only going to know how many offers there are, but you're never going to know the details of those other offers. And you can't ask the listing agent either for those because they're not allowed to disclose the contents of other offers. This may change maybe in a couple of years. We'll see. Um, or in the next year, if they start to allow open bids, we'll see if uh, sellers actually opt for that. But again, just remind your clients, you're, you have no idea what the other offers are. So it's really hard to tell them where they sit. You're going to do your best to find out, but um, remind them that you don't know. Um, again, make sure your buyers are readily available. So ensuring that on offer night, um, typically you're going to get um, an offer registration time and an offer presentation time. So ensure that your clients know like, hey, I need you readily available on offer presentation day to respond quickly. So again, sometimes things can go very quick and you want to make sure that your buyers are available. If you need to make any quick changes to your offer, you need them signing quickly. You can't be waiting all night for them. If a seller does decide to sign back their offer, then you also need to be readily available. So make sure your clients aren't, if they're on vacation or they're away, make sure they're available at least from like a certain hour time frame. But anything that you can do to make sure that they are constantly there, you can either be with them in person most of the time you guys are both at your own houses and then everything's done virtually these days. Okay, another thing to do is understand the sellers. So this is a hard one to do, but finding out what pressures the sellers have. Um, again, a lot of the time, the agent's not going to tell you why they're moving. Um, if it's a job transfer, then you know, hey, they're really motivated. If they're growing a family, a divorce situation may get messy and um, you know that they need to get out and like money may not may, money may or may not be a big thing. Um, but if you can find out what the pressures the sellers have, this could strengthen your buyer's negotiation positions. So that's what I was saying. If you could find the neighbors somewhere around, figure out what their stance is, they may give you a little bit of a trinket on why these guys are moving. Um, some like things that you may see. So if you go into geo warehouse, some of the tips that you can see is um, how long they've lived there. So if you see that the sellers have actually lived in that area for a decent amount of time, um, you can like if they've lived there, they raised their family there, they've been there for 30 plus years, they may actually have a little bit more um, sentimental value in what type of buyers moving in. They may actually want a young family moving in as well versus having an investor come and rent the place out. Um, if it's a first time buyer um, price range, 
Um, maybe the clients just bought it a few years ago. Typically money is more important. They don't really care what types of buyers are coming in. So if you can go in Geo Warehouse, see how long the families have been in the house, this may help strengthen your position a little bit more. If you notice that it was rented and it's an investment property, your little buyer letter probably isn't going to do any good, but your buyer's letter may actually do a little bit more for, again, a seller that's been there for a little bit more, a bit longer and might have a little bit more sentimental value for it. So you may actually get your clients. I'm sure you've all heard about this is getting a personalized letter about themselves give a face to the offer and let the sellers know like who's actually moving into this home. So this is a really important um, little touch that you can add with your offers. Now there is a note. If you are the only offer on a property, do not use this letter. This will work against you sometimes because it can show how much your clients love the house and that maybe they'll go up in price. So these letters only really work in multiple offer situations or if you're having a hard time getting the seller coming to the seller's price because maybe you don't have the budget for it or you just can't, sometimes that letter will like say, hey, listen, I can't come up to your price, but here's who my clients are. It's a young family, first time home buyers, yada, yada, yada. So it really does help personalize the offer when you're there. So don't hesitate to ask your clients to write a letter for you. If you need to whip it out, you can. Sometimes it's good to either present the people before the offer if you're in a multiple offer situation, or sometimes it's good to do the offer and then send the letter a little bit after. So I would kind of see what the situation is before you go ahead with the letter. I will tell you the letter does not work though if your price is way below the other offers. It's very rare where you'll see a seller that has a last place um, buyer with a letter and they're like, you know what? I love that buyer. I'm going to take that buyer because it's a lovely family. Not going to happen. The only way this letter is going to happen is if you're already, if you're already up there in price, maybe you're second place and you're losing by, let's say $5,000. They may put a little bit more sentimental value on that client versus someone that has maybe $5,000 more. So again, this letter is not just going to take you from last place. And all of a sudden you're going to win the bidding war. You still have to come in strong um, with no conditions, price, all that stuff for that letter to actually work. Okay, so let's, now that we're on the topic of um, strong offers, let's talk about what makes a strong offer. So we talked about certain things to prepare you for the offer night. Now we're gonna talk about what's gonna make a strong offer when you guys are preparing it. Um, so tip number one, I would suggest always giving your best offer first. When you guys get offer instructions, you're gonna notice that it'll say, Give your best offer first. There's no guarantee of second rounds. And there is agents out there that will not do rounds. If you're one of our agents here and you are a listing agent, always, I think it's always such a nice thing to give everybody opportunities to improve their offers. Nothing sucks more than when you're going into multiple offer situation and the listing agent just takes the first round and then goes with it. Um, so in the risk that you may deal with an agent that does do that, it's always start best to start with your best offer and keep the negotiations to a minimum. So we know you guys want to be a hero, um, get your clients the lowest price possible. But when you're competing with other offers and the sellers have a certain expectation, that doesn't quite work. So the other thing is maybe you're competing against 10 offers. If you go in with your low offer, but you could have come up really high, Sometimes the agent's not even going to give you a consideration because you're so far behind. They're like, well, I'm not going to call that guy because he's not going to come up this much money. But on the listing side, I have come across times where like the fifth place buyer, I did second or third rounds and that fifth place buyer comes out of nowhere and has all this money. So that's why, again, as a listing side, you want to go back to every single buyer because you just never know who's going to come up and by how much. So again, if you've got a certain amount of money or a certain budget, I would always go in with a strong price right from the get-go because then they're going to take you seriously and they'll keep you in the loop to see if they can get more from you. So always go in strong, work with the um, very closely with the other agent and see if you guys can come to a middle ground. So again, if you guys do offer a lower price, you may lose actually risking that home altogether. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about logical price versus emotional price as well when you guys are when we're talking about prices. Um, your clients are going to ask you, hey, like what price should I go in at? And it, again, it's a really hard question to answer, right? As a real estate agent. 
So I always talk about there's a logical price, which is the price it should sell for based on like what's sold out there, um, basically the market value of the house. And then there's an emotional price. So how many of you guys have actually gone through an offer night? You lost, you woke up the next morning and you saw what that house sold for. And you're like, who was crazy enough to offer that price? Like there's always a crazy buyer, right? So I call that the emotional price. And typically buyers that are offering this emotional price are the ones that are winning. It's a price that makes zero sense, but it's usually a buyer that has been beaten out already in like two, three, four multiple offer situations. They're over it. They just want to get it done or they really loved the house. They'll pay whatever they want for it. They don't care if it's above what it's worth. They're going to pay it. So usually there's an emotional price that comes in the multiple offer situation and it's a price that makes zero sense. So I would say most buyers that are going into their offers on, for the first time, most of them want the conditions. Most of them are very um, hesitant to go to that emotional price right away. So this might actually take three or four bidding wars for them to lose before they finally come up with their emotional price. And they're like, forget it. I'm over this. I want to win. I don't want to look at any more houses. And then they chuck this crazy price out. And then everyone looks at it like, who is this crazy buyer? So there's always one of them. So whenever you're talking about price with your clients, always talk about, okay, well, there's going to be the logical prices, which what it should sell at. And then there's going to be our emotional price, which is the price that someone just wanted to end it all and get the home. So those are two prices. And you're going to talk about it on offer night. Be like, okay, we can offer the logical price. You may lose. If you really want to win it, then you've got to really think about the emotional price that you have in mind that is a little crazy, but also will help you win. And th those are the two prices that you need to talk about um, with your clients for sure. Um, I'm sure you, a lot of you guys out there know. And also just from the seller side, again, because I want to let you guys know what's happening on the seller side. So when you have multiple offers, let's say you've got, let's say you've got eight multiple, eight offers on the table. Typically, five of those offers are going to be terrible. They're going to be close to asking, a little bit of asking, or low. So don't get very overwhelmed when you see eight, 10 offers. Five of them are bad. One of them's like, okay. And usually there's two that really stand out. One is like higher than your expectations. And then one of them like blows everybody out of the water. That is pretty much what I see on, I would say, 90% of the listings that we deal with is that there's really only two offers in that pool of um, buyers that is actually going to give you a crazy price or something above everybody else. Most of the time, the buyers are all within the same amount, but there's always two that are above those the rest of the crowd. So when you're going into offers with your buyer clients, let them know that to kind of ease their pain. Be like, okay, just because there's 10 offers, just know eight of those are going to be like meh or say like five of those will be meh, three of those will be like, okay two of those are going to be good. So that kind of eases the pain a little bit for your clients too. Tip number two is keep it simple salesperson. So again, few, fewer conditions and the less complicated your clauses you include, the better chance your offer has to be accepted. So don't make things overcomplicated, but also protect your client in the best way you can. I've had so many offers where they'll be like, oh, seller agrees to let the buyer take a buyer's name off or sellers agree to let the buyers add an additional person or different clauses with like appliances. Like once you start to complicate things, the seller doesn't want to deal with that. They just want things to be clean, cut, simple. And that's the offer they're going to go for. So again, with the conditions, obviously, if you can go in firm, that's a done deal. If they, if you go in conditional, then it risks the deal not going through. So of course, sometimes Sellers will take a lower price at a firm offer versus a higher price conditional. And that's just because it's just a more stable offer for them to consider. All right. So what, again, what makes a strong offer? Tip number three would be to look for the common ground. So what can a buyer give up? That maybe doesn't mean a lot to the buyer, but it's important to the sellers. And I was talking about this a little bit earlier, and that would be closing date could be one. So maybe it's a first time home buyer. And then the sellers are a step up buyer. So they already bought a property. So they have a specific closing date they want. And that's very important for them to have. So if your sellers are okay, maybe their price is like a little bit lower than what the seller wants, but that closing date is exactly what they want. That may be something that's appealing to the seller. So don't overlook those small details such as closing date, deposit, irrevocable, all of that. So look for different common grounds 
Um, even for example, if you're negotiating, I don't know, a water filtration system, for example, that may be something that maybe the seller wants to take and the buyer's like, well, I want that. And you're like, well, it doesn't really mean that much to me as the seller or as the buyer. So let's let the seller take the water filtration system and then we'll keep our price at this. So there's different little things that you guys can look for in common ground that isn't always the price. It could be things that are included in the home, like a air conditioning rental, a furnace rental. These are different things. Be like, oh, the seller has a rental furnace. I don't want that rental furnace. But if the seller doesn't have to pay for it, maybe that makes it more appealing for me as a buyer to win that house. So maybe I'll take on the rental. So there's different things that your clients may decide that they want to take on that the seller doesn't want to deal with. And your client's like, whatever, it doesn't mean a lot to me. So let's give it what they want. Uh, larger deposit is good and hand is better. So this just shows the sellers that your buyers are serious. So again, if the deposit is high, your clients are less likely to walk away with a larger deposit. So we always recommend about 5% of the purchase price. Um, and having that bank draft in hand is also going to strengthen their offer as it can either be delivered that day um, and not risk the buyers having remorse for the next day. Um, and so it just shows like how serious you are. So what you can do is get your clients to go to the bank, get a bank draft, take a photo of it, take a photo of it and send it over with your offer. That way the clients are like, great, they're good to go. We don't have to worry about waiting the next day and praying that um, that uh, deposit comes through. It's already here. So this can um, actually strengthen your offer as well. And my tip number five would be to review the price last. So usually the price is the most sensitive issue. So let's work through like the conditions. Let's work through the closing date. Let's work through the deposit. And then we're going to talk about the price. So get through those like other little details before you review that with them. Okay, so now we are on offer presentation day. So you guys can kind of see the flow of where I'm taking this presentation a little bit. So offer presentation has arrived. You've prepared your clients the most that you can for this day, and then you're ready to submit your offer. So here's a few negotiation tips to really ensure you can kind of secure that home for the clients. So my tip number one on offer day would be to re register your offer as soon as possible. Um, this is like up for debate. There's some people that prefer to wait. There's like the offer registration time and then there's the offer presentation time. So offer registration, you're just saying, hey, I've got an offer written up, ready to go. I'm coming to play. I'm gonna register my offer, not submit my offer. Just give them, tell them I'm gonna be participating in the bidding war today. I would say, don't wait to register your offer, especially if you already know you're going to be putting in an offer, no matter how many offers come in, you're coming in either way. So I wouldn't wait to register it. And then I would take that day to really spend time building report with the listing agent, not asking them questions like, what are your expectations? Just asking them simple questions. Say, hey, I just wanted to introduce myself. These are my clients. We're looking forward to um, submitting an offer today. So you're really just keeping them in the loop. If you started from the beginning, they're going to see that effort right away. And hopefully they're going to build a little bit more trust with you and help you out a little bit more than they would on someone that came in well after the um, registration time. Um, you can also, if you wanted to, register your offer after the showing. So even if it's a week before offer night, you could write up an offer, have the irrevocable for offer night register it. And then this really shows the other side, how serious you are and how you want to be kept in the loop if anything happens in the meantime. So again, don't wait always the last minute. If it says four o'clock, don't register at 358. There's zero, there's really no real strategy to it other than you're waiting. Um, it's kind of fun to like do it in the morning, scare people, be like, all right, there's an offer already registered. It's early in the morning. And then they're like, oh, great. We're going to be competing. So it might actually deter some people from coming in if you start to register it a little bit early. Um, double check to make sure that your buyer is in multiple offers before you present the offer. So like I just said, you're going to be, or you're going to be registering an offer at a certain time, and then you're going to be submitting an offer at a certain time. So register your offer, but don't actually submit your offer until you know for sure if you are competing or not and with how many offers. So again, you can still register your offer ahead of the time. But if those other offers do not materialize, or maybe it's not as many offers as you expected, then you can take this opportunity to consult with your buyer regarding restructuring the offer. So you're going to be restructuring your offer and deciding later. So you can even submit this a little bit after they say the um, presentation time is just to make sure that you, you're ready to go. 
um, if possible, negotiate in person. So this is something of the past that we don't typically do anymore, but believe it or not, even in my day, which was just six years ago, we used to get in our car on multiple offer nights. The listing agent would be in the house with the sellers. All the buyer's agents would be in their car. We would all be sitting in our cars on the street with our buyers in our car. You would have your offer in your hand and you would walk into the house and you would present your offer directly to the sellers. You would leave the offer and then you'd go back to the car and hang out with your with your buyers. And this is how offer nights were done. And we we do them at the office as well. Sometimes the clients would come to the office. The agents would all line up, present their offers to the agent, and then they'd go sit in their car in the parking lot. This was, it's the best way to influence people is if you can get face to face. Again, I'm not seeing it a lot, but if you have the opportunity to present your offer in person, I would, because you can get a lot more done quicker if you're face to face versus phoning and emailing and all of that. So there is more power to be had when you can negotiate in person. Um, so that's one of the things. So again, if there's that opportunity, go for it. Um, be confident. This is a huge one, guys. So even if this is your first time, be excited, be positive, be confident, especially when you're talking to your clients, but more importantly, when you're presenting your offer um, to the seller's side. So don't go in nervous, don't go quiet, but also don't be too aggressive because this can really turn the sellers off and they're going to lose confidence in you and in turn your buyer. So you really do need to go in professional. There's nothing worse than seeing an agent get aggressive and angry with you. And I'm going to talk a lot about that as well, but um, just try to be fun, be easy to work with, be excited, be happy, and you're representing your clients. So you want to make sure that your clients feel like they're being represented by the best agent. That's going to be having some tough conversations behind closed doors that they don't get to see. So you want to make sure that you're putting on your best professional behavior when you're doing this. Um, don't give up too much information about the buyers. So if your buyers do have the ability to pay cash, for example, maybe they have high income careers or some sort of financial advantage, don't let the sellers know this because they may hold firmer on that price. So instead, just tell them their names, who they are, why they're buying, why they like this home, where they're coming from. Give them a few little hints and tips. You can say, hey, they've been pre-approved. I have no issues with them, but don't be like, yeah, they're this like high role in celebrity, no problem on the cash because then the seller's gonna be like, oh, this guy's got more money. So you gotta be really careful with how much information you give about your clients, but you also wanna give some confidence that they are financially ready to close a transaction as well. Um, pass on compliments. This it can't over, I can't over express this enough. Don't go in a multiple offer situation or any offer situation with negative comments about the home. So this is by passing compliments about the home, this is going to build trust between the parties and it's a friendlier negotiation. So tell your seller or tell the sellers why your clients love this home in particular, instead of trying to justify the price based on all the things that need to be fixed, comparing it to other homes and really just throwing insults at the sellers. So there is, I've been in so many situations on the listing side where the buyer's agent tells me, well, this house had better upgrades than yours and yours is this and this one was way better and blah, 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 blah. We know, but it doesn't put a nice taste in our mouth when all you're doing is talking bad about the house. And this happened um, many years ago. One of my first, um, one of my, not one of my first offers, but one of my first in person and this agent was sitting at the kitchen table with us. And all she talked about was how negative this house was. She's like, that house was better. Um, I don't know this one. Ha yours has worse floors than that one. And, and it was a house. She was comparing mine to a house that was already like also on the market. It hadn't even sold yet. So eventually I just said, well, like, what are you doing at this offer table? You're talking so well about this other house that's down the street for sale. Why don't you go buy that house? And it would kind of caught her back because I was like, listen, like, it sounds like you don't even like this house. So why are you even offering on it? And it doesn't put a good taste in your mouth. Cause you're like, well, what if these guys back out? It doesn't even sound like they like the house. So when you're going to present an offer, tell them why they love the house, not why the price should be less than this house and all these things that need to be done. Talk about how great the home is 
Your clients love the home enough to be putting an offer on it. So let's talk about the positives about it and why they love it and not how terrible it is. (laughs) So if I can give you any advice when it comes to negotiating, it would be to stop comparing the other, the listing agent has definitely seen the comparables. They already know. And that's why they're priced in a certain way. So keep that in mind. And when it comes to negotiating, have different ways to negotiate in a more positive way versus a negative way. So it could be like, listen, my clients love this house. They will do anything to have it. I want to work with you. What can you do to help me get this home for my clients instead of bashing it? So you can see like the two different ways. And again, put yourself in the listing agent's shoes. Um, We've been there many times where the buyer's agent's like, the house is not worth this and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you get above that. And then the buyer's agent's like, what? Like you start to believe it sometimes as a seller's agent when the other side bashing it. And then all of a sudden you find this buyer that loves the home enough and they surpass what that other agent could have given. So just a tip when you're talking to the other agents. Um, Another thing is to compliment the listing agent. So don't even just compliment the home, compliment the listing agent. Um, especially if it's in front of them. Um, If you can compliment the sellers and their agent on all the efforts for preparing the home by complimenting the agent in front of them is really going to build trust that they have in their agent and hopefully in your favor. So if you compliment the listing agent, like, wow, like this is a really nice agent to work with. I'm going to help them. And then the sellers are going to now listen even more to their agent because you just complimented how great they were. So that's another tip. Um, if you need to get down to it, it gets, if like maybe you're stuck in negotiations, your clients aren't coming up, sellers aren't coming down, then we need to get onto a more emotional level with the seller. So we need to remind the sellers why they're moving and how excited they must be. Um, this could also be something you use with your, with your buyers. You need to remind your buyers why they're moving. Maybe they already sold a property. You're like, listen, you already sold a property. You need a home. So we need to figure out what we can do and focus on their plans as well. Um, Carly and I were in a negotiation phase where we did end up in this situation. Again, it was in a kitchen, (laughs) um, where we were just sitting in the kitchen. We were all stuck on a price, but they loved our clients. We loved them. We wanted the house. And eventually we had to keep saying, listen, you're moving, you're retiring. You already bought a property. Let's focus on getting you to that next step into your next home. Instead of figuring out like why we're fighting over $10,000 right now, let's really focus on, Hey, we can sell this tonight. Everyone can go home happy. And then you get to move into your next home. So sometimes you have to re put everybody back into reality and remind them why we're here today and why we're moving. Um, leave your ego at the door. This is something that I cannot stress enough, especially if you are a brand new agent. Um, so don't lose sight of the end result. at the end of the day, guys, our goal is to help our buyers purchase a home. And again, not beat up the seller and their agent. People want to work with friendly people. So if you try to show any aggression or anger when things are not going your way, I promise you it's going to work against you. And I see this a lot with new agents in particular. I did it myself. I thought I had to be this like tough, strong woman um, and just angry. That's how I pictured negotiations being this like (laughs) really mean process. I, the best agents out there are some of the most friendly professional agents you will ever work with. And in fact, some of the top producers that I've worked with are the best. They're so happy. They're open. They're friendly. They want to get the transaction done for their clients too. And then I've seen other agents that get mad at you. They get, they puff their chest up. They've got this big ego and it goes, it actually works against you. Like the sellers don't want to work with agents that are like that because then they think that's how the rest of the, the clothes, because you still got to get through closing. This could be two months of working with you. They don't want to work with people like that. And then they assume that your clients are also like that. So definitely leave your ego at the door. If I could give you any piece of advice, you will sell way more homes by being a nicer agent to work with, a professional agent to work with, and someone that just has confidence. So sometimes when you show that aggression and that anger, it actually shows a lack of confidence um, or a lack of negotiation skills because that's just what you do. So try to hold back from um, bringing that side out and uh, just be nice. (laughs) Perfect. So if you guys have questions, this would be your time to put it into the chat. I've come up with a couple questions that I really do get on a regular basis when it comes to um, negotiation. So if you have questions, put it in the chat and I will get to them. Um, But one of the questions I get a lot is how do I deal with client anxieties around the negotiation process? 
And this could also be your own personal anxieties. Maybe you're, maybe you're very anxious about going into multiple offers. And so this may calm you down as well. So some of my key things for how to deal with your client anxieties um, about going into multiple offers, um, even if there's multiple offers, I would still encourage your clients to go through because it just gives you an indicator of when they go to sell their house in the future, this is a high demand property versus one that's not getting offers, maybe not a high demand property for when you sell in the future. So it's really important to remind them just because there's a lot of offers, I would still go ahead and continue on um, to compete because it's a home that they probably like. But anyways, keep your expectations low. Um, don't make any promises that you can't fulfill. So when you guys are writing offers, don't say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that this, they're going to accept this offer. They're for sure going to accept this offer. How can they not? Because then you're going to get your client's hopes up and we don't want to do that. So try to keep their expectations low throughout the whole process. Um, prepare them for any counter offers or how the process works. So again, talking about all those different situations, preparing them for offer date, going over the offer. These are all really good things that are going to help um, reduce the anxiety for your clients. So just by over, um, over educating, I guess, promise to keep them as informed as possible or as soon as possible. So as soon as you hear back, just say, Hey, I'm going to keep you posted the entire process. I'm going to be in constant contact and you're going to be the first person I talk to. Um, when you're talking to them, you really do need to talk with confidence. Um, they're going to be leaning on you to be that calming force for them. So if you're acting all stressed out, you're freaking out inside as well, it's going to keep their anxieties high. So they want to know that you've done this before, you know what you're talking about, um, you, you're good. So you have to be the calming force, whether you're stressed out or not. Don't let your clients know that you are stressed because you are their guide. <laughs> Um, knowing your local market stats, comparables, everything about the home, this is really going to assure that you're confident, but it's also going to help your clients know that they're negotiating at a good price and at good terms as well. And then we talked a little bit about the logical price for emotional price. Um, okay. Why is it important to present your offers in person? So we talked a little bit about that. So I'm going to skip that one. Let's talk a little bit, a little bit about <laughs> bully offers. So I know we get this question a lot and some buyers want to, they're like, listen, I want to give a bully offer. So when your clients ask you this, let them know what a bully offer is and what they need to do in order to get it accepted. But typically a bully offer is also known as a preemptive offer. And it's an offer that's submitted and expires before the date and time of the offer presentation. So it's someone that wants to get in there, they don't wanna compete, and you're really being a bully. So in order for the sellers to actually consider reviewing your bully offer and kiboshing the entire process that they had planned, your offer needs to be something that they don't want to risk losing. So typically it's a price um, for example, that they're not expecting on offer night. It's something way above what they thought it was going to be. It can't be like, it can't be the obvious number. Like if the house next door sold for 850 and then you're going in and around that price, they're probably going to get that offer on offer night. So your price has to be well over what they expected. It definitely cannot be under asking because that's, they're just not going to consider that. And it cannot be asking. So if you're going to be giving them under asking, or if you're going to give them close to asking, then I would just say, wait for offer night because the sellers aren't going to risk losing out on the momentum just for an offer that's below asking or at asking. So again, price needs to be crazy number that they have no idea. And then they're like, yes, I want that number. We're probably not going to spend on offer night. Let's go. It also needs to have a strong deposit. You need to have at least 5% or more and it should be in hand. So if you want to be a real bully, you need to have that offer deposit ready to go. Be like, hey, I've got a strong price. Money's in hand. I'll deliver it today. So that also makes it very strong. And do not submit a bully offer that is conditional. I have seen so many bully offers that are conditional on financing or conditional on home inspection. Doesn't matter. If you're going to put a conditional offer as a bully offer, you might as well take those days before the offer night, get the mortgage pre-approval, get a home inspector in there, even if it's an hour home inspection. The reason why a seller will not accept or doesn't make sense for them to accept a conditional offer is because it, that deal still has the potential to fall through and then ruin their entire strategy. So you can try to submit it with conditions, but let your clients know, like, don't be shocked when they reject it. So 
Instead, again, just use those extra days prior to offer night to fulfill those conditions that you would have needed and then come in on offer night with a firm offer. So you may have to talk to the home inspector. You may need to talk to the mortgage broker. You may need to submit a status certificate to the lawyer. Do this all before offer night so that on offer night you are prepared. You've got a firm offer. You're ready to go. So again, if you don't understand the, the conditional strategy, because I get it all the time, they don't understand why. Let's say you submitted the offer on, say, Monday. Offers were supposed to be Friday. Say they accepted your offer on Monday and they were like, yep, we're not going through with offer night. You do a home inspection. It falls through. Now, like, there's been no showings. The momentum's killed. The offer night's killed. A seller's not willing to risk it for a conditional offer. The other thing to do is you need to have a quick irrevocable. You don't want to give these guys 24 hours to work your offer. You want to be a bully. So sometimes I've seen bully offers that are as quick as an hour, two hours. And you're like, hey, here's my offer. I'm only giving you two hours to make a decision. And then I'm moving on to the next property. So again, if you're going to be a bully, you got to be a bully. And it needs to be something that's quick. You don't want to give time to get more multiple offers going. And then you kind of, you're setting yourself up for a strong um, offer. Um, someone's asking how much over asking is considered a bully. Honestly, it depends. There's no real number. Um, I would say it just has to be a crazy number above like that's above like the comparables. If I can give you anything like some people don't underlist their properties that much. So it may not go over. So there's no real number of what it needs to go above. But when you're looking at comparables, it needs to be at least at par with what has sold or above that. It can't be below what the comparables are. They're just going to wait for offer night anyways. All right, here's a tip just again from a listing agent side, but how do you know if your offer is winning? And the answer is you're not going to know if you're winning or really losing, but there is some um, signs that your offer is being considered. And that's if the listing agent is calling you. So if you have an, a listing agent that's calling you and they're letting you know things that you can improve on the offer, and it in particular, it doesn't include the price. So if you get, maybe you've done your um, offers, you're on a couple rounds, the agent calls you and is like, hey, just going through your offer. Um, can you get rid of that survey? Um, hey, can you get rid of that light fixture that you included. We don't want to include that. Um, can you increase your deposit? Can you change your closing date? Typically, if they're asking you to make these little changes, it typically means that the listing agent really does like your offer. They don't want to sign back your offer though and risk losing it all together. So the strategy is to really have you improve your offer so that you, they can be the accepting signature of it. If the list agent is not calling you at all or communicating with you throughout the negotiations, this is a good sign that they're working with another offer and they've probably been on the phone with one or two other agents the entire time and you're just kind of sitting there. So if you find that the listing agent is not calling you or communicating with them, call them as soon as possible. Don't wait for them to call you for another round. Call them and be like, hey, you haven't called me in a while. I assume I'm losing. What do I need to improve my offer? And then you may need to talk to your client and say, listen, they're not talking to us. I have a feeling we're losing. Do you want to go up in price? Do you want to improve your offer? And just do it without waiting for the other agent to ask you to. It's okay to improve your own offer without them asking you to. So if, you, if it's been crickets, that's a good sign that you're losing. And that's where you kind of build the momentum back up with the listing agent or call your clients right away. Um, and then I've just got some, this is my last question. So again, if you've got some quick questions in the chat, feel free to leave them. Um, but this one may say, my buyers want to lowball their offer help. <laughs> so there is some different um, strategies that you can use or different scripts, but even if it's not a lowball offer, maybe you guys are actually about to win. Maybe you're only losing by, let's say $6,000 is the deciding factor, which at the end of the day is not a lot of money. So if the seller said, hey, can you come up $6,000 and I think I can make it happen. And your client's like, no, I'm not coming up $6,000. Then you may need to reverse negotiate and negotiate with your own buyer client. So you can use certain scripts like, let's talk about, there's the ball in the court. Um, let's talk about that. So you would say to your clients, listen, my experience tells me that this house is worth what they're asking me to do. I understand that you want the best price, but if you come in too low, you're going to risk offending the seller or losing the deal. So if you can prove 
if I can prove to you that the house is worth asking price, would you even consider it? No. And then get what they're willing. The other stuff you can do is meet them halfway. I like this one a lot. So let's just say there's only $6,000 standing between you and the perfect house. Would you consider meeting them, meeting the sellers halfway to bridge the gap? So if you don't want to offer a 349, would you consider 346? If we do, I think the offer will be much more appealing to the seller and hopefully we can get you this home. So again, you can kind of like come up with different terms like, hey, you don't want to come up 10K, but why don't we come up 7K or why don't we come up 5K? So you might have to negotiate when it comes to like those little numbers with your clients to get them over the edge. Um, the other things that we talked a little bit about are the trade-offs. So if we're not willing to budge on the price, is there anything else that we can do to make the offer more attractive? So can we waive some conditions? Can we get rid of some shadows, some fixtures? Um, the, is the closing date proper? What can we out offer to that seller that will help push them to our offer? So these are different little scripts that you can use. Um, do we have a presentation we can use with our buyers about what to expect during multiple offers? Um, I do not. Um, I know we've got our buyer's guide, but I think it talks a lot about just generic. I would even, you guys have this um, option, but it's not a bad idea to have a presentation or just have like a little note section. So if you're getting on the phone with them, then it's not a bad idea to have a little presentation for them to prepare them for multiple offers. I think that's a great idea. I unfortunately don't have one. <laughs> I just have this. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Any other questions from you guys? And on Facebook too. If you guys are on Facebook, let me know. Perfect. So I'm sure you guys are all getting um, into the multiple offers again. I'm starting to see it slow down a tiny bit, but they're still there. So again, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to email you guys this booklet just for a reminder for you guys and give you guys some tips. But if you're in a live situation with a client, please do not hesitate to call myself, Carly, Paige, Nelson, Claire, Ginny. All of us are available, especially if it's your first offer night. Um, don't hesitate to contact us if you guys need that extra help, extra looking over your offers, even just being available. Um, just give us a heads up. Be like, hey, Caitlin, I'm going on an offer night tonight. Do you mind just being available? So if you guys are going on an offer night and you just want to make sure that one of the management team is available for you, don't hesitate just to shoot us an email and let us know you're going into multiple offers and that you may need um, some extra support or guidance um, during the night. So we're happy to do that as well. All right, perfect. I think I got most. Okay, awesome. So no more questions. Um, I will email you guys the presentation today. It's not a presentation, but I'll email you guys the booklet. It's also on your Google Drive. And then again, if you have any questions, just let me know. And this will also be on YouTube. So if you guys want to rewatch this whole session, we'll be on YouTube. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you are on YouTube. And we will catch up with you guys soon.